Hi, thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Nada Youssef, and you're listening to Health Essentials Podcast by Cleveland Clinic. Today, we're broadcasting from Cleveland Clinic Administrative Building here in Beachwood, Ohio, and we're here with Dr. Robert Bales. Dr. Bales is a family physician and an assistant professor of family medicine here at Cleveland Clinic. Thank you so much for being here today. And please remember, before we begin, this is for informational purposes only and it's not intended to replace your own physician's advice. And so before we start, I'm going to ask you uh, off-topic questions sure. just for icebreakers. Okay. Uh, all right, so first one. If you could be cast in a movie of your choice, what movie would you choose and what character would you play? Um, I'd have to say Star Wars. Star Wars? Yeah. All right. And which character? Probably Han Solo. All right. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. How about um, if you could choose only one place to go on vacation for the rest of your life, where would it be? There's an island called Bequi. It's in the Grenadine chain. Huh. It's a very tiny Caribbean island just uh, north of um, Grenada. Nice. So you want to be secluded. Yeah. Sun and water. Perfect. And then what aspect of your personality adds the most value to the world? Probably my energy. Energy, yeah. high energy. Yeah, I'm. Good. It, I don't stop. Good, that's excellent. <laughs> I don't stop. <laughs> all right. Well, let's go ahead into discussion. Okay. We're going to talk about BMI and obesity. So sure. first of all, let's talk about just the definition. What exactly is BMI? What does it stand okay. for? So BMI stands for body mass index. Okay. It's a calculation. So we take a person's height and a person's weight. We convert that into um, metrics, so centimeters and meters, mm -hmm. or kilograms and meters, mm -hmm. and we calculate weight per body surface area. Okay. So it's measured in kilograms per meter squared. Okay, okay so um, it's, it's calculation. It's, it's easy because in my office in family medicine, we can measure your height, we can measure your weight, and we can get this BMI calculation. Yeah. So essentially it, it takes, basically taller people should weigh more. So okay. it sort of normalizes height okay. across people. Um, and then sort of, 18 to 25 is considered normal. Okay. Um, up to 28 is considered okay. Okay. Over 28, so 28 to 30 is considered overweight. Okay. 30 to 40 is how we define obesity. Okay. And above 40 is something we call morbid obesity. Morbid obesity. Under 18 is anorexia. So it, uh, there, you know, we can also use it on the low end of the scale. Sure, sure. So for the BMI, you are taking measurements like the height and the weight mm -hmm. and then age. Is that is that is that considered in there at all? Um, for for this, it's adults. Okay. So adults over eighteen. There are scales for children. Okay. So we, when we look at growth charts in children, mm -hmm. from newborns on up through adolescence, we do chart out their BMI, so length versus weight. Mm -hmm. um, but this, it changes. The scale is different. It it's changes, you know, almost yearly. I see. Oh, wow. So there's actually a graph we use for that one. It changes for kids. yearly. How come? Um, because as kids grow, they, they tend to have less weight per height. I see. I see. So it's, it's a little bit of a different thing. We look at a curve. I see. Rather than, um, so when we're talking about... Um, BMI on adults, that's the, the 18 to 25 mm -hmm. and 30 and 40. I do remember my two little kids at the pediatric office. It's always a scale to show the length mm -hmm. of everything from head measurements to yep. length to height. Yep. Okay. Great. So, so it is used on kids, just kind of like a different measurement. Now, I want to ask if it is accurate. BMI, I've heard that it might not be accurate because it doesn't measure muscle mass. And if so, why is it still being used? Right. So it doesn't tell you anything about body composition. Right. So there are people, um, particularly competitive bodybuilders or power lifters, who carry a lot of muscle mass, mm -hmm. whose BMI will be high because they weigh more, and it's not really a good indication, indication of what their body composition is. Mm -hmm. For the vast number of Americans, it, it's a good rough estimate. So you would call it a rough estimate, but not too accurate, right. correct? And it's more accurate outside the normal range. So if somebody has a BMI ah. of 50, then okay, you, know you can pretty much tell that they're right. carrying a lot of extra body fat. Right. Where if somebody has a BMI of 28, does getting it down to 27 mean much? Pro 
Probably not. I see. Okay. And then underweight. So if somebody's got a body mass index of 16, yeah. that's clearly in the anorexic zone. And, and that's pretty accurate, too. Sure. You can't really have such a low body mass right. and, and, you know, be carrying a lot of fat. Okay. So for um, athletic people that mm -hmm. do have a lot of muscle mass, um, there are other BMI measurements? Well, there are other ways to measure body composition. Okay. So BMI is BMI. You, you need height and weight, and that's it. Okay. Um, so you can measure body composition. Mm -hmm. There's a, several different ways to do it. Um, the latest is a thing called plasmography, where you stand on a scale that has metal plates, mm -hmm. and you hold on to a hand thing, and there's a, they measure the electrical resistance of your body. And the idea is that fat is an insulator and it will change the electrical resistance. Mm. Um, that's all I know about that. You, you now know everything I know about these <laughs> scales, but you will see them advertised. Um, you can buy them for home. Oh, okay. Um, the, a lot of gyms have them. Sure. Um, the caliper testing is probably the standard tried and true method of a exercise physiologist goes and measures skin folds on different parts. So that's the fat measurement. That's, that's the fat measurement. So they fat. right, and okay. they take I think twelve or fifteen different measurements oh, to, okay. to calculate body fat. Mm. You can also do underwater weight, okay. and I'm not sure if we do that at Cleveland Clinic, but I've heard of it being done. Is where you weigh somebody in a pool, oh, okay. and so the less you weigh in a pool, the more fat you have because the more it floats you up. Um, but like I said, I don't know. I do know we do do the caliper test at Cleveland Clinic. Okay. Um, I don't know if anybody so does body underwater, underwater weigh. Way. How about the? Is it like a, some kind of body pod, like a DEXA scan? I've, I've read something about that. I think that's more along the line. Well, DEXA is to measure bone density. Okay. So your DEXA scan would be for osteoporosis. Oh, okay. But there is a body pod, which I, th I'm not really familiar with that technology. That, okay, it's newer technology. Yeah. Okay, so if someone's considered overweight or obese, what is the first step? Like, let's say I would go to the doctor, sh sh check my BMI, I'm 30. Right. What do I do? Um, so the first line treatment is diet, exercise, weight loss. Okay. Um, and also setting, you know, what's your target? Goals, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's take these and kind mm -hmm. of uh, dissect them. First, the diet. <laughs> so right now, mm -hmm. with the abundance of food around us. We have highly processed foods. We have a lot of sugar. We have a lot of cardboard boxes. Um, mm -hmm. so what is healthy? Okay, so <laughs> first, I, I heard this recently, and I, I can't remember where I heard this quote, but somebody was talking about the standard American diet. Yeah, the SAD. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really think that's true. Yeah. Um, in this country, low quality food is cheap and high quality food is expensive. Right. Um, so most Americans do eat a pretty poor diet, mm -hmm. um, either because financially they can't afford it yeah. or because out of time constraints. You know, it's hard to work a job or work two jobs and come home and cook a meal from scratch and, you know, and get the kids to basketball practice or softball practice or dance or, you know, right. it, we all lead these sort of crazy busy lives. Mm -hmm. And so I think we cheat ourselves on our diet and, um, you know, getting more takeout, more fast food, or just things we can put in the microwave. Yeah. So convenience and cheap equals unhealthy. Yeah. Right? Yes. Okay. So what do you think about something like the diets that are out there right now? One of the big ones I always talk about is ketogenic diet, high fats, low carbs, very low carbs, mm -hmm. and basically almost no sugar, right? right? So what's your take on sugar, fat, and carbs in this whole diet? Okay, so the, the keto diet is a whole lot like the Atkins diet yeah, from, what, right. 10 years ago? Yeah. Um, and what it does is it puts your body into a state where you're burning calories because, you, because you're not getting any sugars in, so you've got to convert either fat or muscle to sugar. Sure. So you become ketotic. Um, they work... Um, I find most people can't do them for very long yeah, seems just like a short -term thing. because they're so restrictive mm -hmm. and it's 100% or nothing. So right. you've got to right. either hit them every oh. single day yeah. or they don't work. Okay. So if you can do it, they work. You will lose weight. Mm -hmm. um, 
hard for the long term. But they're hard for the long term because they're so restrictive. Right. So what do you suggest? What, what is the diet that you would recommend? So, so the diet I favor most is along the lines of the Mediterranean diet. Okay. Um, you know, mainly fruits and vegetables yeah. with uh, whole grains, whole nuts. Uh, protein comes from seafood is mm -hmm. the, probably the best. Um, protein that comes from nuts and soybeans, you know, legumes. Mm -hmm. Um, minimize the red meat. Okay. Um, is, is soy good for us? Soy is good for us. Soy is good for us? Yeah. Okay. So I want to talk about drinks. Okay. Um, because you see energy drinks and, and healthy diet <laughs> drinks. Every every brand has some kind of diet <laughs> going with right. it. Right. But then you, you hear about what diet actually is and the sweeteners and, and what it actually does to the body. So what do you say to that? the people that are trying to go healthier and they're going for diet drinks? So... If we're talking about like carbonated sodas mm -hmm. or carbonated energy drinks, we generally recommend people not consume those. Mm -hmm. um, even you know diet sodas have there's some effect on increasing weight in people who drink regular amounts of diet soda. Okay. Now it may be sort of a decisional balance thing where people, okay, I, I'm I'm having a diet soda, so therefore I can have the large fry. So we're making trade-offs. Yeah. Um, there may also be something to stimulate appetite. Um, in well, in the, the diet from the yeah, because it tastes like sugar, it may mm -hmm. stimulate your appetite. Mm -hmm. And our body doesn't know the difference; it just knows that it's taken in something really sweet. Right. Okay. So right. regular, uh, you're talking about like someone taking it daily, yes. daily uh, soda or diet is, right. is just as bad. Right. Okay. Um, and you know we're really concerned about the energy drinks. There has been Stop. some reported um, issues of heart problems in people who consume high quantities you know people who are drinking six seven of these uh, cans per day wow um there has it's been a some large amount right it's that's a lot of caffeine that is yes. and a lot of sugar right uh, tons of sugar um the other drinks you see out there there are um you know healthy drinks mm. so like w one thing i see a lot of is a meal replacement shake okay so it it should the label should read like a balanced meal with some fats, some carbohydrates, and some proteins. Okay. And I, I usually tell my patients these are okay to have, um, particularly if you can't get lunch. Okay. So, you know, if you're going to go through a drive through to get lunch, I would rather you have something that's more of a balanced meal in a shake, okay. um, as long as it's not high in sugar. Now, this, uh, this, uh, I wanted to ask you this, so sorry to interrupt, right. but... Are you talking about store-bought shakes? Because a lot of times you go to the store and if it's blueberry flavored or apple cinnamon, it's all natural flavors or sh added sugar. Or are you are you suggesting do this at home, add your own avocado and add spinach and make your own thing? Um, either or, mm -hmm. if, you, if you buy them online or buy them from the store, you really gotta read the labels and know what's in these yeah. and yeah. make sure there's not a lot of extra additives. Mm -hmm. But you, you can actually make your own sort of smoothies sure, sure. out of kale and spinach and avocado and not, I mean yeah. there's there's it's lots of recipes milk. online yeah. um, but I would rather somebody have one of that than you know sort of resort to fast food for sure. for particularly for, for, for lunch, lunch. Sure, sure. Um, so what about a drink like let's say like amino acid um, I don't know you call them supplements or shakes right. or drinks that people drink with water sometimes on a daily basis Again, there's a lot of weird um, labels on the back that yes, I, when I look at it, I have no right, idea what right. I would be taking in. And, and I, I think of those more as sports-centered things. Okay. Um, you know, the original one is Gatorade. Yes. Which yeah. was, you know, designed for the Florida Gators football team right. to rehydrate them while they're playing football in Florida. Right. Not designed for, you know, driving around, running errands, chasing and kids, drinking, and drinking. Yeah. Um, but then there's also... Uh, pre-workout, um, sort of intra-workout and post-workout drinks mm -hmm. that for somebody who's a moderate to competitive athlete may be the right thing for them. Okay. So these are okay as long as you're moving on a daily basis and you're using your muscles. Right. So I, I run triathlons. Uh -huh. Okay. So, you know, the longest one I do is a six-hour, you know, um, swim bike run. And you lose a lot of fluids, a lot of electrolytes. So we use electrolyte solutions and sugar supplements during, yeah. but not while I'm walking around in my day-to-day -day life. Right, right, 
Um, you know, a, a lot of people who do strength training, um, it's recommended to take in some protein within 30 minutes of your strength session. And that can be broken down branch chain amino acids, protein, it could be a chicken breast. It, mm -hmm. There is some benefit to recovery by taking in some protein mm -hmm. post-workout, okay. post-strength workout. Okay. Okay. Um, so depending on what you do, your nutritional needs may vary, um, especially when you get into long endurance racing. So let, let's keep talking about exercise, okay. if that's okay. Because, yeah, exactly. I mean, looking at obesity right now, most of us have, you know, a nine-to-five job, sitting in a cube. We don't get to walk around much. Right. Um, so is this another reason the sedentary lifestyle is causing obesity? And how much exercise should we – I mean, is a half hour a day okay to just sure. walk? Um, so Americans are definitely not a walking culture. <laughs> You know, we will drive two blocks to the convenience yes. store in our cars. <laughs> um, and w a lot of our infrastructure is not set up to encourage walking. Right. So most neighborhoods don't have stores you can walk to. Um, a lot of neighborhoods don't have sidewalks. Mm -hmm. um, the recommended minimum exercise is 150 minutes a week. Okay. So that works out to a half an hour, five days a week, okay. of moderate exercise, which is a brisk walk or faster. Okay. So if you can walk and hold a conversation, that would be a brisk walking pace. Okay, so half hour walk every day, at least five times a week. Mm -hmm. That's it, that's and that will, that'll get you. Okay, that, that's ahead. minimum. Yeah, that's, well that's not it, <laughs> but yeah, that's at least what you should be doing. So <laughs> you know, if, you, if you're talking about burning off excess fat calories, you're gonna have to do more. Okay, all right. So let's talk about genetics. Okay. Do genetics play a role? Um, how our body processes food into energy, how much fat is stored, could that be genetic related? Could be, that, that's really kind of hard to sort out okay. um, with some rare exceptions. Um, so your genetics come from your parents mm -hmm. and most people are raised by their parents mm -hmm. so you're raised in the same environment as your parents and if your parents are not active and are sedentary and overweight then okay. you're likely to be it and it's really hard to separate is that from the way you were raised mm -hmm. or is that from the genetic code you inherited I see. so it's hard to separate that one out um, there are certain very rare genetic syndromes that do lead to overeating mm -hmm. um, but exceedingly rare so what you're saying is environmental factors or how you're raised how mom brings you know home pizza every other day mm -hmm. and they're always drinking and coke and stuff like that that could be a factor versus it just being genetic right okay right well, and it's probably a combination of both okay it could be a combination of both yeah. so to break the cycle just work out be healthy stay away from energy drinks right. all right and what about stress stress seems to be a culprit of a lot of things overeating under eating i mean cortisol is a hormone mm -hmm. that plays a huge role in that correct right. can you talk about that so um right cortisol is your stress hormone it's one of your fight or flight hormones mm -hmm. um you know, our adaptation to stress is highly variable. Um, you know, some people feel stressed out and just work more, work more, work more, work more, and don't take care of themselves. Right. Um, other people feel like if I'm stressed out and I go do my workout, even half hour, 40 minutes, my stress level comes down and I'm more productive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it plays into sleep too. So if your stress level is high, you're less likely to get a good night's sleep. Yeah. So and you if you don't sleep, you're going to be really stressed out. Right. <laughs> it's like a cycle. So it's a cycle. Um, you know, I talk to people all the time who I fall asleep okay, and then 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning I wake up, and as soon as I wake up I'm thinking about work. Wow. And I can't go back to sleep. So, so how, what do you say to, to those people? There's a lot of people that are workaholics that just right. work all the time right. and can't shut that off. Um, you have you to suggest? convince them to change that. Yeah. Um, whether it's, you know, periodically schedule vacations mm -hmm. or, you know, on your daily calendar, put your workout in as an appointment yeah. and actually just yeah. schedule your workouts um, as part of your daily so routine. Just like meetings, yep. put time in there, half hour for a brisk walk. Mm -hmm. And I tell, um, I have a fair number of patients who travel a lot for work. Sure. So they're flying either domestically or internationally. Mm -hmm. And you know when they land at their destination and they have business meetings and the company's paying for them to be there, it's hard not to just work and work and work and work. Mm. And the same advice, 
on your daily schedule put in you know seven to eight a.m that right. i'm going to hit the gym at the hotel and yeah. walk on the treadmill for half an hour and or take your naps mm -hmm. right sleep so let's talk about sleep a little bit okay because we underestimate sleep and what it can really do for our body i mean right. Um, the hormonal changes that can come from from not sleeping enough can that make us overeat or crave junk food? I mean, I've read that. It can. Um, there's a f sort of a flip side to that too. Is that obstructive sleep apnea mm -hmm. is weight related? Okay. So um, the soft tissues on the upper respiratory tract system tend to collapse when people weigh more. Wow. So we see a lot of people who are overweight also have obstructive sleep apnea. So if they're stopping breathing multiple times, hundreds of times per night, wow. then they're not getting that regenerative sleep. Sure. So in, in talking to people who are overweight, that's another thing you want to look into is, do you have sleep apnea? Right, right. So how many hours of sleep should someone, uh, should make sure that they're sleeping at night? Because again, that's another thing. We work a lot, kids, it's just life is busy. We mm -hmm. sometimes get five hours, sometimes we get eight or yeah. nine. What is Good target is six to eight. Six to eight hours. Mm -hmm. Okay. So six to eight hours would be normal, and that wouldn't change any kind of hormones or anything no. like that in the body. Okay. So um, how about some side effects from uh, some medicines that people take or any kind of medical condition conditions or even thyroid? Could that all affect sure. uh, obesity? Sure. So uh, underactive thyroid is related to weight gain. So when one thing, if you see the doc, if you go see your family doc and say, you know, I'm overweight, they should at least run some blood tests, check a thyroid, check your kidney, liver, check a sugar, make sure you're not diabetic. Sure. Um, you know, people with diabetes gain weight um, because they can't process the sugars right. properly. Right. Um, and that's sort of a, the weight causes the diabetes and the diabetes makes the weight. It's, it's another that cycle. another cycle. Yeah. Um, certain, um, we call them atypical antipsychotics. Mm -hmm. um, they're used often in second or third line for like depression treatment. Okay. Can stimulate appetite, can cause weight gain, can elevate your cholesterol. So anybody on these certain classes of medication should have periodic blood testing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the blood testing is to check the sugar for diabetes? Mm -hmm, and to check the cholesterol. Cholesterol, okay. As well. Because okay. heart disease is a big deal with obesity, is that it's, so obesity is related to heart disease, related to, you know, the increasing number of people in the United States becoming diabetic, um, increasing problems with arthritis. Right, right. I mean, you're, if you weigh 350 pounds, you're putting all that force through your knees. Sure, sure. Um, so, I know we talked a little bit about cholesterol right now. We did talk about diet earlier, but I want to go back to it. Mm -hmm. Something like saturated fat and, and cholesterol. We've heard many different things, and you know, a lot of our uh, dietary guidelines used to say to stay away from meats and to stay away from fat mm -hmm. and saturated fat. Now, coconut oil is not that bad for you. Something like the keto diet. What is right. your take on that? Um, well, the keto diet, you're tricking your p metabolism. Yeah, but in, you're eating a lot of fat. Right, you're getting a lot of fat, fat that from could be saturated fat, fat from coconut oil and right. things like that. Um, you know, you sh really the you should have some proteins, some fats, some carbohydrates, and each one has the good, better, and best. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we heard a lot about uh, corn syrup during the Super Bowl. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> um, but w you know, we do tell people to avoid products sweetened with corn syrup. Yeah. Um, and same thing with fats. Fats that come from um, nuts, Boy, avocados yeah. are better for you. Mm -hmm. um, cold water fish okay. tend to be better. So the omega threes. Um, so stick to good fats that come from avocado, right. like wild caught salmon, things like that. Where the so trans good. fats, not so much. The you know, right, where course, yeah. things people f tend to use for uh, frying. Yeah, no fried chicken. I've been reading right. about fried chicken too. <laughs> that it's increasing increasing uh, heart attacks or cancer, mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff, which makes sense. So who's at risk for obesity? We said it could be genetics, mm -hmm. but it could be environmental factors. Could right. be both. Could be both. Um, what about psycho psychological factors such as depression? Because that's a big so one, too. People with major depression or major depressive disorder are more likely not to take care of their own personal health because mm -hmm. of their mood disorder. So that's where that comes in. 
they tend to be, you know, you can be sedentary. Um, now, some people go the other way and they don't eat right, right. when they're depressed. Sure. Um, but mood disorders definitely play a role mm -hmm. and should be looked into. Yeah. So for treatments, yes. we've talked about lifestyle, behavioral changes, um, being educated on better food choices. Um, so you recommend to go to your primary physician to do the BMI tests, mm -hmm. to do some kind of physical. It, what, what should be the first step? First, see your family doctor. See your family doctor. See your family doctor or your general internist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they should run some basic blood tests. Mm -hmm. They should take some basic measurements. Um, one measurement that we probably don't use enough is waist circumference. Okay. So if you measure your waist one inch below your belly button, um, that's a good measure of, you know, are you losing abdominal fat? I see. So if you start an exercise program, start a diet, and you're losing s inches around your midsection, even if the scale doesn't change a whole lot, that's actually a good sign. So tell me why the midsection is it? Because just that's the stubbornness fat. <laughs> well, th that tends to be the the fat we associate most with disease. I see. Is 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 truncal obesity, okay. um, and that's where you tend to carry most of, right. most fat gets deposited there. So if you're losing inches around your midsection, mm -hmm. um, which is a little bit higher than your belt line, okay. then that's a sign that you're losing fat, you, especially if you've gone from being sedentary to now maybe doing some strength training, you put on a little muscle, the BMI may stay the same. Right. That's another thing, because the muscle mass. Because the muscle mass, right. right, will skew that a little bit. Okay, good. So, let's say healthy diets, increasing daily activity still doesn't work, and let's say someone is <laughs> obese or morbidly obese. Are there prescriptions or weight loss weight loss surgery that people can consider? Yes. Okay. Um, so there's four medications on the market specifically for weight loss. Mm -hmm. um, so these would be pills. You take it once a day. And it just makes you not hungry or right. it They're helps you shed fat? What nope, they cut, cut your appetite. They cut your appetite. They, cu oh. they curve your appetite. Um, and then there's the Bariatric Institute. Mm -hmm. um, that, that Those are the doctors associated with the weight loss surgeries. Sure. Um, and we offer that. Yeah. Um, in so it's usually a process to get to that point mm -hmm. of, you know, you've done the medical dietary exercise not seen great results. Yeah. Maybe you've tried a medication, and then um, <coughs> you would progress to see the bariatric surgeons. Sure, sure. Great. Well, before I let you go, did you want to talk about the findings that you have I with you? Did today? there? There was an interesting paper. Um, it was published in the Lancet in two thousand August of two thousand sixteen, mm -hmm. which um, took two hundred and thirty nine clinical trials, combined the data from two hundred and thirty nine clinical trials and found that in people who never smoke cigarettes, that increasing BMI was associated with all causes of mortality. All causes. All causes. Wow. So we're seeing increased cancers, um, definitely heart disease, diabetes, arthritis. Um, but they, they looked from trials across the world, wow. and they were finding this increase in all causes of death. And you said non-smokers. In non-smokers, right. These That's are the a huge factor. Right, yeah. right. So we took smoking out of the equation yeah. because we know that smoke, diseases related to smoking, right. increase all kinds of, uh, you know, um, are very prevalent. Right. right. Um, so wow. this just isolates BMI better. Sure, sure. Yeah. That's that's uh, that's big news, yeah. I think. Um, so again, anything you want to tell our viewers or listeners before I let you go? Any tips, tricks? Um, you know, I think first start with your family doc. Um, exercise the you've got to enjoy it yeah that's the thing is if if I tell you to go run 5k and you don't like to run yeah. you're not gonna do it so you got to find something you like to do yeah. um, and that can be you know there's adult soccer leagues there's men's basketball leagues there's yeah, there's water aerobics if yeah. you feel like yeah. you know you want to get in the pool Zumba, right. exercise, all kinds of stuff. there's all kinds of things but you have to have fun doing it yeah. Otherwise, you're not going to stay. You're not going to go tomorrow. Right. <laughs> right. Right. So um, try different things. Find what you like. Mm -hmm. um, Eat a Mediterranean diet. Moderation. Eat a Mediterranean diet. Watch the um, sugars that come from drinks. Mm 
Yeah, sugar intake. So calories that come from drinks, um, they're kind of, we don't always count them. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you so You're much welcome. for coming in today. You're it's welcome. been a pleasure. And for more information or to make an appointment with a Cleveland Clinic family physician, please call 866-320-4573 or go to www.clevelandclinic.org slash medicine institute. And to listen to more of our health essential podcasts from Cleveland Clinic experts, make sure you go to clevelandclinic.org slash H-E podcast, or you can subscribe on iTunes. And for more health tips, news, and information, don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, and Instagram at Cleveland Clinic, just one word. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time.